So today I want to talk about something I find really interesting. That is the geometry of the group SL2Z. That is the 2 by 2 integer value matrices whose determinant is equal to 1. So as I mentioned, it is a group, so you'll want to have uh, understood the concept of a group before watching this video. Uh, you should also have some familiarity with complex analysis, at least just manipulating uh, complex numbers. Uh, and probably this shouldn't be your first pass at the idea of Mobius transformations, although I will describe what those are, so you might be able to get, to get away with it. Uh, so in the first video, uh, today's video, we're going to be describing the actions of uh, two different groups, SL2C and a subgroup uh, of it, SL2R, and how it acts on the complex plane, or more specifically, the complex Riemann sphere. That will lead us to wanting to describe the action of uh, SL2Z, which is going to be in the second video, because uh, proving things and getting into the nitty gritty of it is going to take a little bit more work and a bit more time. So that's going to be the focus of the second video, where we're going to be able to prove uh, something that I think is just really neat, uh, the fact that SL2Z is finitely generated and describe what those generators are. Now, that in itself isn't super interesting, but the way in which we do it is by exploiting how SL2Z acts on this geometric space and sort of feeding that information back into the group. Uh, then in the third video, we're going to get into what's called the moduli space of complex elliptic curves. So, some of those words might sound uh, scary or confusing to some of you, uh, but don't worry, I will explain at least in an intuitive sense uh, what all that means and why we should care, which in turn tells us why we should care about the work we did for SL2Z. And to cap everything off, I think that uh, understanding this will help lead to a definition of weakly modular forms that is maybe more acceptable in, than a lot of textbooks. I've noticed myself, when you first come across the definition of a modular form, it's like, well, why is that the transformation property uh, that we're going to use and not something else? So I think there's a somewhat natural road to that through understanding these videos, and that's what we're going to cap this series off with. So, without further ado, we want to start describing SL2C and SL2R, and that means we're going to have to go to the Platonic Realm! So the first order of business is simply to review the definition of Mobius transformations. Now, this is in itself a very interesting and uh, rich subject, which would be covered, say, in a uh, first or second year in complex analysis, uh, we're not going to go too much in depth, uh, just cover the basics of what we need uh, moving forward. Uh, so recall that the group SL2C, this denotes uh, the collection of all 2x2 two two matrices with complex entries, such that their determinant is equal to... And we're going to describe an action of SL2C on the complex numbers. So to describe the action of some group on some space X, uh, that simply means, uh, well, we require that, of course, the identity element uh, leaves things unchanged. And we also require that uh, having two elements of the group, say uh, H and G, if we were to multiply them in the group first and then act on a point, that'd be the same as having H act on the point G uh, acting on that point. And the way that we're going to define this action is that a given matrix A, B, C, D, uh, this is going to act on a point of the complex plane by sending it to AZ plus B over CZ plus D. I'll leave it to the viewer to check that this does uh, satisfy the axioms of a group action as this basically just comes down to some matrix multiplication. Uh, but there's one thing you might notice already, there's an issue here. So Z could be any complex number, uh, C and D can be any complex number, as long as we're uh, satisfying this determinant one condition. So what could happen, what happens if the denominator vanishes? So this definition is fine, in other words, if uh, Z is not equal to negative D over C. With, uh, of course, C not being equal to zero as well. 
and we are to evaluate the limit of this uh, quantity as z approaches negative d over c, we would expect it to go to infinity. So we're actually going to toss in uh, a point infinity called the, well, the point at infinity. And sometimes a shorthand for this is uh, c hat. And this, uh, this will allow us to define uh, the action to simply be infinity uh, in the case when z is equal to negative d over c and c is not equal to zero. Finally, now that we've added a point at infinity to our space, we need to consider uh, the case when the point that we're starting with, z, is infinity. So once again, if we were to consider the uh, this standard expression az plus b over cz plus d, well, if we took the limit as z approaches infinity, uh, we would obtain that this is a over c, uh, at least in the case when c is not equal to zero. And finally, uh, again, c being equal to zero in the denominator, we would associate that with being the point at infinity. So in this case, uh, we would have a fixed point at infinity uh, when c is equal to zero. Okay, so this gives us a full description of what are called the Mobius transformations, and it acts on this uh, extended complex plane where we've added a point at infinity. This is referred to as the Riemann sphere, uh, which is also the same thing as the so-called one-point compactification of the complex plane uh, for you topologists out there, or say for you geometers, uh, this is the same thing as the complex projective line uh, CP1. So if you don't know what those two things mean, uh, don't worry about it. But the idea is that not only do we just have some abstract point representing infinity, there's actually a geometric intuition to this. And so the idea is that all the points in the complex plane, which have large norm, can be realized as being close to infinity. So the way that this gets packaged up is one draws a literal sphere and the equatorial line of the sphere, this is the complex unit circle. The south pole of the sphere, uh, this is zero, and everything on in the southern hemisphere of the sphere is everything that's inside the complex unit disk. All the complex numbers outside the complex unit disk get mapped to the northern hemisphere, and the uh, North, the North Pole itself becomes uh, this uh, so-called point at infinity. And we also have this uh, longitudinal line going across. And uh, so our complex unit circle is the equatorial line and the longitudinal line, uh, this is uh, the real numbers become a copy uh, on this longitudinal line. And so here we see uh, why the word sphere uh, comes up in this name Riemann sphere, uh, because uh, adding in this point, we have this geometric notion, uh, which gives us uh, this spherical shape. So as I mentioned, there's lots of really interesting things that how Mobius transformations uh, act on the Riemann sphere. And you can look at the, the different neat images that come out of that. Um, but the approach that we're going to take to starting to understand some of the actions, uh, some of the way that the action behaves on the sphere is by looking at how certain subgroups of SL2C uh, behave on this sphere. So we've already looked at the action of SL2C and now we're going to look at a subgroup uh, SL2R. So this is, again, just two by two matrices of determinant one, but now we're restricting their entries uh, strictly to the real numbers. And to see how this group uh, breaks up the action on the Riemann sphere, uh, we're first going to look at what happens if I were to apply some matrix gamma, which is, uh, just a shorthand for writing a matrix A, B, C, D. So throughout the series, when I write gamma, I typically mean a matrix A, B, C, D uh, belonging to the appropriate group. I'm going to see what happens to the imaginary part of uh, Z when I apply this matrix gamma to it. 
So the first thing we do, of course, is just expand out our definition of the Mobius transformation. So we know that this is just AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And then in order to understand uh, this complex number better, I can make the denominator real. So I'm going to multiply the both the numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. So I get uh, AZ plus B over C Z bar plus D. Recall that uh, C and D are real in this case. We're now assuming them to be real, so they're unaffected by complex conjugation. And now the denominator just becomes the complex norm of CZ plus D squared. Now my denominator is purely real, so I can pull that out in front and I get the imaginary part of uh, expanding out the numerator, uh, this becomes AC multiplied by the norm of Z squared plus AD multiplied by Z plus BC multiplied by Z bar plus B multiplied by D. Now A and C are real and so is the norm of Z squared. So the imaginary part of that is zero. And B and D are real, so is their product, and so the imaginary part of that is zero. Furthermore, the imaginary part of Z bar, uh, the, that is Z conjugate, that is just the negative of the imaginary part of Z. So really the two remaining terms I have here, the, the AD can come out in front, uh, the BC can come out in front, I'm gonna have the uh, imaginary part of Z, and here I can write this as the imaginary part of Z uh, with just a, a minus sign coming out in front. So altogether I get uh, AD minus BC multiplied by the imaginary part of Z, and this is all going to be over the norm, uh, the norm squared of CZ plus D. And since AD minus BC, well, that's just the determinant of the matrix gamma. And we're assuming in this case that our determinant is equal to one. Uh, therefore, AD minus BC is one. So we find that we have the imaginary part uh, of Z over CZ plus D squared norm. So what does this mean for the action of SL2R in terms of this Riemann sphere? Well, consider if the imaginary part of Z were equal to zero to begin with, then following through the steps uh, of our argument here, we can see that the imaginary part of gamma applied to Z must also be equal to zero. Therefore, SL2R can be seen as acting on the real numbers because these are precisely the complex numbers uh, with zero imaginary part. Uh, furthermore, if we're thinking about AZ plus B over CZ plus D, uh, well, the only case in which we obtained infinity from a regular complex number was when that complex number was negative D over C. But in our, we're assuming now that negative D over C is real because both D and C are real. And so what gets tossed in here is also the point at infinity. So if we think about this on our sphere, what this is saying is that the group SL2R, it will only shuffle points around on this longitudinal line, referring to the real numbers uh, plus the point at infinity. Uh, we can also see that if the imaginary part of Z was greater than zero, well, we're only dividing by a positive number. So the imaginary part of gamma Z will remain uh, larger than zero. And similarly, the imaginary part, uh, if the imaginary part of Z were less than zero, uh, by the exact same argument, we can see the imaginary part of gamma Z remains less than zero. So the group uh, SL2R also uh, preserves the space uh, H plus. So this is the space of all the complex numbers whose imaginary part is strictly greater than zero and the space H minus whose imaginary part is strictly less than zero. So SL2R only takes points from of the right hemisphere to points of the right hemisphere. It only takes points of the left hemisphere to points of the left hemisphere and it only takes points uh, which lie on this longitudinal line of real numbers plus the point at infinity. Uh, 
uh, back to itself as well. The one way of understanding the action of SL2C on all the complex numbers is to look at how SL2R uh, breaks up this action into these three separate pieces. As I mentioned in the introduction though, there's one other group that we're really interested in here, and that is the group, uh, the subgroup SL2Z. So one thing we could do is just try and dive right in and ask ourselves, well, what are all the complicated ways that SL2Z breaks up the Riemann sphere? But we already know that SL2Z is a subgroup of SL2R. It's just the subgroup of integer valued two by two matrices of determinant one. So what we can do, instead of going all the way to the full Riemann sphere and asking how SL2Z acts, we can ask ourselves, how does it act on each of these subspaces? So for the time being, uh, we're not really going to be too interested in how it acts on R plus the point at infinity. This is just shuffling around some real numbers. And there's a symmetry between the lower complex uh, plane and the upper complex plane. It's going to behave in the same way on both of these. So it will su suffice for our purposes to just study the action on the upper half complex plane. Now, the full description plus proof is going to take a little, uh, a little bit of time, a little bit of work to do. So we're going to see that in the next video where we're going to prove uh, some algebraic properties of SL2Z using geometry. And eventually this will allow us to talk about elliptic curves and modular forms.